Hi, in this video, we are covering projectile motion. Projectile motion is covered in section 4.3 of your textbook, which gives you an example of projectile motion. I think you had a reading assignment about that. And the textbook does go on to derive a few formulas. And I think sometimes a mistake a student can make is look at these formulas derived, the time of flight, um, I guess trajectory and range. And um, some students can get hyper-focused on these numbered formulas, thinking that that's what you have to memorize, that's what you have to learn. And nothing could be farther from the actual approach in physics. So in this video, what I want to do is I want to show you the derivation of the formula. Not to show you the derivation of formula because you can read that from the textbook, but to demonstrate the kind of flexibility that you gain from by being able to derive the formulas from the first principles yourself, rather than memorizing this final result that someone else has done. If you know how to do this yourself, then when someone tweaks the situation a little bit or changes something, you can do it yourself. And that's uh, really the power of the problem solving approach in physics. So let me take uh, some amount of time showing you that. So this is a kind of a standard setup for projectile problems, where you have a projectile that is launched in a direction at some angle, theta from horizontal, with an initial speed of v naught, And in the standard setup, this happens on a level ground. So the projectile follows some trajectory and lands. And there are some common things we can ask about this setup. We can ask, what is the range, r? We can ask, what is the highest height reached by the projectile? Or you can ask, at what time does the projectile land? Those aren't the only types of questions you can ask, and that's the first flexibility you gain. By being able to analyze the entire situation, you can answer no matter what aspect of the situation someone asks. You don't need to have a set formula for that. If uh, you have a framework for analyzing the whole thing, then you just look at that part that you have worked out. So for our example, let me label these A, B, and C, and answer these questions. So the first thing you have to do is break down motion into components, into the horizontal and vertical components. And you start on that by breaking the initial velocity into horizontal and vertical components of the velocity. So this here is the representation of the velocity vector, and it has horizontal component and the vertical component. And the vector is at angle theta from the horizontal component. So it feels a little bit silly reminding you of this, but here you use a so ka toi to figure out the expressions for these components. You know, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, Tangent is opposite over adjacent. I mention this because sometimes students make uh, mistakes swapping a sine and cosine. And a lot of that comes from, um, I don't want to call it laziness, um, automatic habit. <laughs> so let me show you a way to avoid that. So the way to avoid that is to really to draw the triangle as I've done here and use these trig relationships to write out that relationship. So looking at the y component of the velocity, it's the opposite side. So given the angle and the hypotenuse, I can relate it to those with this. So um, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, or rearranging that, the opposite side, v o y is equal to the hypotenuse v naught times the sine of theta. And the x component is the adjacent side. So 
V naught x is equal to the hypotenuse V naught times the cosine theta from ka. Now, what I mean by automatic habit is, uh, frankly, you are going to see expressions like this a lot. And sometimes people get into habit of thinking that that's always going to be the case. And I just want to caution you. It depends on the situation. Sometimes you will see cosine associated with y component. Sometimes you will see sine associated with x component. And the way to avoid a mistake is uh, do what I did here. Draw the triangle and work out the trig relationship. All right, now that you have broken the velocity into horizontal and vertical components, what you first have to remember for projectile motions is that the horizontal and the vertical motions are independent. What that means is you figure out the acceleration that applies to each component and you write out what looks like a 1D kinematics equation for each of those components. So the acceleration along the x direction or horizontal direction is easier, it's zero. So the horizontal kinematics equations will appear simpler. And the acceleration along the y direction, oh, let's say the upward is positive. So it'll be minus g. All right, let me write down the x component first. It's easier. The x position is equal to the initial x velocity, v naught cosine theta times time, plus, oh, the initial x position. I need to define my axis, and I'll say x is 0, where the projectile starts. That makes things easier. So that's it. Because the acceleration is 0, the kinematic equation is simpler. Now let's do the vertical component. The y position is equal to 1 half times the acceleration, which is minus g. So minus 1 half g t squared plus the initial y velocity, v naught sine theta times t um, plus the initial y position. I guess I should make this explicit that y is equal to 0 at the ground. That seems like the easiest choice. Um, and there are more interesting kinematics equations you can write for the y component because the velocity will be changing, so you can write the change of velocity equation and the v squared equation becomes interesting too. Um, so keep those in mind, but for now I wrote the position equations since I'll probably be using them. Okay, then the second thing to remember for projectile motion problems is x and y motions occur at the same time. Um, so what does that mean? The equations share t, the variable for time. So it's not just a coincidence or a mistake that these are the same. They do represent the actual same time, and that'll be useful later on. Okay, let me number the equations and start out with the first question. What is the range? So range r is the horizontal distance. So I'll use equation one r is equal to v naught cosine theta, where given all those, times, I need a time. So I'm looking at something specific here, time at this point in the motion. So I don't want to just label it with a simple letter t. I want to give it a little more description so that I don't confuse it with the general variable t. So I'll call it t subscript land because I'm looking at the time when the projectile is landing. Okay, so I need to figure out uh, when this happens. And if you're just looking at the x component of motion, you'll never find it. x component of motion is very boring. It's just a constant speed of motion that's just going. <laughs> so, um, so this is where it's important to remember that x and y motions occur at the same time. You can look at the vertical component of motion to see what information there is that you can use. And I hope as you look at this diagram that you realize when the ball lands, the y position is equal to zero. So that's the connection we are going to use. At time when the projectile lands, the y position is equal to zero. So let's uh, write out that equation. 
so at the landing time t, the y position is equal to 0, and that's equal to minus 1 half g t land squared plus v naught sine theta t land. So looking at the second equation, it's pretty simple. Solving it for t land, by the way, one factor of t land cancels out. It's because one of the times when y is equal to 0 is t is equal to 0 at the very beginning. So solving for t land, you get this. 2 v naught sine theta over g. Let me label previous equation, equation 3. So plugging this into equation 3, we get the range right away. Let me write that down. Range is equal to 2 v naught squared sine theta cosine theta divided by g. Now, you can actually simplify this a little bit more. Let me leave that as exercise for you. You will need to use the trig identity double angle formula. Uh, specifically, the sine double angle formula says sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cosine theta. And you can actually derive this from the angle addition formula. And, um, well, I'll remind you of those trig identities when they become more important later in the semester. All right, that's A. Let's answer part B. What is the maximum height? And there are different ways to approach this. Uh, I haven't used the V-squared formula in my lectures yet, so let me use that this time. Um, you can also use the other approach. Okay, so the V-squared formula is... Uh, is a, let me write my version here off on the side as a reference. V final squared minus V initial squared is equal to 2 times acceleration times the displacement. Okay, so for part B, what's important is remembering that X and Y motions are independent. Here, for the maximum height, the only thing that matters is the Y component of motion. The horizontal component doesn't matter at all. So I'm going to ignore the horizontal component altogether for determining the maximum height and treat this like a one-dimensional kinematics problem involving the y component. So at the very top, the y component of velocity is zero. That's the point where it's neither moving up nor moving down. So that's my final velocity, zero squared minus the initial velocity, I'm looking at the y component, v naught sine theta squared, I'll just square independently, is equal to 2 times the acceleration, and you have to be careful with the direction here. The acceleration is downward, so I will say acceleration is minus g times the displacement. Well, again, careful with the direction. The displacement is upward, so I'll say it's plus the y max. All right, we have to solve this for y max, and it looks like it's pretty simple, so let me just do that. y max is equal to v naught squared sine squared theta over 2g. The 2 minus signs canceled out, fortunately. Okay, now part c. What is the time at which the projectile lands? Oh, that uh, looks like uh, something that I solved for already. And this is one of the reasons to organize your work and keep good track of what you have been working on. Uh, not only because that makes it easier for someone else to read, grade, understand it, because you might find that some of the intermittent result that you derived along the way to answering something is needed elsewhere again later. So keeping your work organized and neat uh, helps you find that. So let me just copy that in my collection of answers. So the time asked for in part to see is t land. So t is equal to 2 v naught sine theta. That's all. Uh, these are the answers. Now, if these answers were all you are looking for, then it might look like I didn't gain anything. You could just look to them up in the textbook. Well, that could work for a standard problem like this one. 
where the ball is being fired from level ground, landing on level ground, and there's no surprises or any twists. But I started out saying that when someone introduces a little twist, knowing how to do this yourself gives you a lot of flexibility. So for example, imagine someone saying that instead of being launched from the ground level, the ball is being launched from some height, h. If all you memorize is the formula, then sorry you are out of luck. There's no formula that handles that. But if you knew how to do this, then you can look through your equations and then see that in equation 2, we had that term for initial height. So instead of that being 0, now that's h. And with that change, you can work through the rest of the question. Or another change someone could introduce is instead of wanting the ball to land at the level ground, someone could ask for a situation where the ball lands at some height higher up or lower down. Imagine the question asks the ball lands at some height h above ground. And once again, if you are looking for a pre derived formula, you won't find that. These variations are just too many. You won't just want to have those formulas all pre-derived for you. But if you know how to do this entire problem yourself, then you can go through your derivations and realize what needs to change is instead of the landing height being 0, it should be the height h. And to tell you the truth, these modifications do make the problem harder. They make the algebra harder and that's why I didn't do it. But they are doable. Uh, you just have to use some quadratic formula or you might have to do it numerically. But they are doable. But only if you know how to set up these problems from scratch, from first principles. So you will get plenty of problem solving practice working through the homework problems. One last thing I wanted to emphasize, I think you might have some questions that are like this. There's a reason through this entire set, I was using symbols and I didn't plug in any numbers. And that's because of the additional flexibility working through the algebra symbolically gives you. Some more difficult projectile questions will give you information in a kind of backward way. For example, instead of giving you the initial velocity, and asking you for the final, which is very logical, easy to think sequentially, they might instead actually give you the final information. Maybe they give you final velocity, or they give you the range and height, and ask you for the initial information. And if you are used to plugging in numbers at the very beginning and working through, how to do that backward can be challenging. But if your practice had been to work it out symbolically and then plug in numbers at the very end, then doing it backward is no more challenging than doing it forward because all these equalities, they are bi-directional. They work forward and backward. But all that works only if you have them in symbolic form. So that's why I demonstrated this example using symbols only and especially coming into Physics 4A, that might be a new practice for you, and I just want to recommend that to you as something worth practicing this entire semester. So that's all. Until next time, bye.